but not all of Mecca escaped Muhammad's wrath. Flush with victory, his troops marched straight to the Kaaba. Seven times they circled the shrine, as those who'd come to seek its protection appealed to their idols. But it was not the pagan people Muhammad had come to destroy. It was their gods. He raised his staff, and the tribal gods of his ancestors smashed into dust. When Muhammad entered Mecca and entered the shrine, and destroyed the idols in the shrine. This is of great cultural and symbolic importance in Islam. By breaking the idols, he was breaking apart the tribal system in which each tribe really had its own independent deity. This was shocking to the Bedouin. This was saying, the gods of our fathers are being destroyed. In some sense, you're saying that our fathers themselves were deluded. How can you say this in a tradition in which relationships to one's father and tribe were primary? So this act of iconoclasm then um, is seen um, as, a, as an act of um, prophetic violence that has just as much importance in Islamic tradition as um, Moses' breaking of the tablets when he saw the idolatry at Mount Sinai, or Jesus' um, casting the money sellers out of the temple. The destruction of the idols was a new beginning, a breaking from the past and the creation of a powerful new force. Mecca was just the beginning one after another, the tribes of a nation were summoned to the fold and united under the banner of Islam. A worldwide community of faith was begun, born in an extraordinary alignment of history, personality and conviction. What Muhammad did was to bring a sense of solidarity, a sense of mission, and he united all these separate segments within the peninsula from then on moved eastward, westward, northward, southward. The Muslims turned to the north, swept into present-day Lebanon and Syria. They continued west into Egypt and quickly across North Africa, fortifying the coastline of the Mediterranean. Only the seas stopped them. Its growth was so explosive uh, from uh, 622, the year one of the Islamic calendar. Um, within 50 years, people whose father had had been camel herders, were now governing one of the major empires in world history. Within 200 years, it extended from Spain to China. The Muslims absorbed the Sasanian Empire of Iran and two-thirds of the Christian Byzantine Empire. By now, the empire was larger than Rome. It stretched from Morocco in the west to the Indus River in the east, where the border of India is today. How had it happened that so small an army could conquer an area so large, so fast, so easily? Islam's success in expanding into the Central Middle East and in, across North Africa was due in, in large part because people were fed up with previous regimes. So the idea that Muslims were going across the world saying convert or die is, is really not accurate, not at all. But they didn't have a heavy hand. They didn't rule with a heavy hand. They, they allowed the, the conquered peoples to maintain their, their administrative uh, structures. 
They allowed the Christians and the Jews to maintain their religious law and to be governed by them. And so in many cases, the uh, conquered peoples did not feel the presence of the, the new regime very heavily. Certainly for individuals who felt themselves uh, exploited or downtrodden by an oppressive and even sometimes parasitic priesthood, the idea of Islam being a religion essentially free from clergy must have seemed very attractive. It's the times that creates the movement and sometimes the men. The Roman Empire had collapsed. The Byzantine Empire wasn't strong enough. There was a need for a new vision, a new uh, way of looking into life. And I think what happened at that time, Mohammed's mission filled the void that uh, the societies wanted. They really wanted some sort of solidarity in their lives. The lessons of the Quran, so successful for the Muslims in Medina and Mecca, were playing out on a global scale. As the conquest swept through Syria, the Muslims held their Friday prayers in the church of St. John the Baptist in Damascus, allowing its Christian congregation to continue their services on Sunday. Side by side, the two faiths shared the same building in peace. As the Muslim community grew, they bought the old church from the Christian congregation and built a huge mosque on the site. With Byzantine artisans, they decorated it with golden mosaics of an Islamic paradise. The great mosque of Damascus would become a model for new mosques to come all across the empire. The Arabs transformed their conquered lands, maintaining, improving or expanding the infrastructure. In Tunisia, building on Roman ruins, they devised an ingenious system of water purification, using gravity to separate fresh water from sediments. Part of this system were these two enormous basins that they built outside the city walls. The clean fresh water would flow over the, into the larger basin, where it would then be distributed by pipes to the city. Um, this is, you know, hundreds of years before anyone in Europe ever thought of having running water. All over you find schemes for bringing water from the mountains where there was more water to the plains where there might be less water. They resurrected elaborate irrigation systems, filling the old stone aqueducts with precious water. Agriculture flourished as life-giving staples like wheat were introduced to the Mediterranean region. But Muslims saved their most monumental feat for the holy city of Jerusalem. Islam's first great work of art is the Dome of the Rock. It was built in a city that was holy to Christians and Jews, and it's spectacular.